All right, so for today's lecture, what we're going to be talking about is neurons and glia. So our first lecture on chapter one was sort of giving a brief historical overview of neuroscience, what it is in general. So today what we're going to do is we're going to break down the components of the brain, particularly the cells that compose the brain, neurons and glia. We'll talk about a little bit of research methods that go along with this, as well as talking about how neurons um, are shaped, the different types of neurons, and then ways that we can visualize these cells. So the basic introduction is there are two different types of brain cells, neurons and glia. Neurons are the major um, cells within the nervous system. These are the ones that are going to be processing information, bringing information from the environment into the brain, etc. And then glia are supporting cells, but they do still have a vital role in the nervous system. So neurons process information. They sense environmental changes. They communicate changes to other neurons, and they command body responses. Now, throughout the entire rest of the course, we're going to be talking about the processing of information and how neurons communicate with each other, and how they tie in not only with drugs, but also how they tie in with um, different disorders, as well as all the sensory systems and how information is being brought in. So glia help to insulate, support, and nourish neurons. So if you want to um, think about it in terms of like a chocolate chip cookie, the chocolate chips are the neurons, and then the dough surrounding that is the glia, sort of cushioning and providing nutrient and nutrition and support for the neurons. So all of you should know or be familiar with cells. Most cells are very small, right? So they range from about 0.01 to 0.05 millimeters in diameter. They're very, very hard to see with the naked eye. You need to actually use a microscope. So we need to use microscopes to make very thin slices of tissue to really be able to look at studying cells. So this whole process is known as the field of histology, and histology is the microscopic um, analysis of structures in tissue. So fixatives are used to fix tissue, so we prevent um, things like different proteins and enzymes from breaking down tissue. We use particular instruments known as microtomes and cryostats that are used for slicing the tissue into very, very thin sections. And then we can apply a whole lot of different things um, such as stains um, to be able to visualize different components of tissue like cell bodies, axons, white matter, gray matter, etc. So here are just some brief units of sizes in the metric system. Um, in the United States, we don't use the metric system except in science, but we should. Um, but the unit kilometer meter, centimeter, millimeter, micrometer, and nanometer. When we're slicing brain tissue, we're going to be in the micrometer category. So usually whenever I'm slicing brain tissue, I slice at 16 microns, and that just means micro, uh, micrometer or micrometers. So histology is the microscopic study of tissue structure. And freshly prepared brain tissue really actually has no color to it. It's cream colored in appearance. And when you actually take it out of the skull, you're going to see something like this. It's very vascular. You're going to see a slight pinkish hue to the brain. But if you use certain things like fixatives, um, if you remove the um, blood from the brain, you just have this sort of ball of cream. So in order to actually visualize anything inside the brain, once you cut it, you have to use stains. So there are a variety of stains to be able to look at white matter versus gray matter, look at dendrites, look at somas, look at axons, etc. And so we'll highlight just a brief, um, a few of these stains. So an initial stain is where we stain nuclei of all cells and the material surrounding the nuclei of neurons. So here we're going to be able to really get a good idea of cell counts looking at cell bodies. Now, using nissel stains, we can differentiate between glia and neurons, and this helps to sort of facilitate the study of cytoarchitecture. If you look overall, if you were to look just very, very, very um, in depth, so let's say 20x or 40x on a microscope, you would see just collections of neurons and collections of cell bodies here, 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 and here. However, if you use certain stains that are staining all of these cell bodies and look at it more so in like a 2.5 or a 10x, you see the collection of these cell bodies and you can actually get the architecture of particular brain regions. So this is the hippocampus in a mouse brain, or in a rat brain rather. Um, 
done by one of my friends, um, Caroline Neely, um, a few years ago, looking at histo histological tissue. So you see these purple stained dots are all cell bodies. And those collections of cell bodies give um, the hippocampus its structure in particular regions. So you have the dentate gyrus, the CA3, the CA2, the CA1 fields, etc. Now one of my favorite stains is the Golgi stain. And what happens in the Golgi stain is that neuronal tissue is impregnated with potassium dichromate and silver nitrate chemicals. And what happens in using the Golgi stain is that neurons are haphazardly stained. So here is a picture from a rat hippocampus that I have done in my own research. And each of these small little circles is the soma or the cell body of a neuron. And here are some blood vessels over here. But you'll notice that not all of the neurons are stained. This is something that's really cool with the Golgi stain in that no one knows why only some of the neurons in brain slices happen to actually take up these chemicals. But using the Golgi stain, you can look at soma, or the perikaryon, or the cell body, which contains your um, organelles, um, your nucleus, etc. And you can look at neurites, which are these extensions from the soma. So the, our extensions, or our neurites, are axons and dendrites. So up here, you can see the soma right here. And then you have dendrites, apical dendrites, and basilar dendrites. And in Golgi stain, staining, it's often hard to see the axons. Um, but you can visualize them um, in some ways. So basic parts of the neuron include dendrites. So here are the dendrites right here, and we'll go through um, where these are located. So the soma is the cell body, which is right here. Dendrites are the branching extensions that taper off from the soma. So this is an apical dendrite. And notice as you go further out into the periphery, the dendrite tapers off to a point, right? So it starts off a little bit thicker towards the base, and then as it moves off towards the edge, it tapers off and becomes very thin. So this is a source of input for the neuron. So this whole thing is a neuron. Information is gonna come from some other cell, and it's gonna make a connection onto a dendrite, mostly. And then information is going to come in from the dendrite, and it's going to communicate with the soma, and then the neuron is going to make a decision from this point. The axon is another neurite that arises from the soma. So the soma is in the middle, roughly. And then you have the axon, which is an extension, a large projection neurite that goes away from the soma. This is a uniform diameter. It branches, um, the branches of the axon will extend at right angles and extends over great distances. So it's not just local but you'll have axons that will go through different brain regions or to different brain structures. So um, examples of axons include the axons from your lower spine going all the way down to your big toe in an instance or in an example of axons traveling great distance. So you have your soma, which is your cell body, which contains all of your organelles, your nucleus, etc. You have the dendrites, which are going to be branching out from the soma, carrying information in. And then you have the axon, which takes information out. So we need all those parts, right? You need a part that is going to be bringing in information. The soma is going to take that information, is going to make a decision about whether to fire an action potential or not. And we'll talk about that in a lot of detail in the next two lectures. And then you have a projection neurite, which is going to take that information and send it away. So Santiago Ramon y Cajal, his contribution to neuroscience is one that is huge. So understanding the idea of neural circuitry through the use of Golgi Cox staining, looking at how neurons communicate and the fact that they communicate by contact, not continuity. And basically what this is saying is that all the neurons in the brain are not just linked like this. It's not just one humongous network where there is no break in the line, right? Neurons communicate through synaptic contact, meaning that you have a synaptic terminal of one making a connection to the postsynaptic membrane of another neuron. So let's call this neuron B, and this is neuron A. Neuron A sends information and releases little chemicals that will then bind to receptors or proteins on cell B, and that will send information to the B soma. So it's not just a continuous thing going like this. 
there's a tiny little break. So these are coming into contact with each other. And these are very, 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 very small gaps. These are about 20 nanometers. So the neuron doctrine um, briefly says that neurons adhere to cell theory. And the cell theory, remember, is that the basic idea that all tissue is made up of these individual components known as cells. Neurons are the brain cells. So through the use of Golgi staining, we can actually look at these cells and how they are not continuous with one another, but how they come in contact. And again, this was resolved in, 19, in the 1950s with the use of electron microscopes with the fact that you can get so close, um, so close in terms of clarity where you can actually be able to see the synaptic clefts and the fact that there is not a continual just exchange of information between two neurons. There's a tiny gap where there is um, some lack of continuity. So inside of the cell is separated by the neuronal membrane. And so this is the part of the course where if you haven't had cell biology or if you haven't had any kind of bio courses that have looked at defining the cells since high school, I would definitely recommend reading the book in a little bit more detail and going over this PowerPoint um, definitely a few times. That way you just sort of have a good understanding of what's going on. So the soma is again this overall cell body. Collectively, the soma contains all of the organelles that are vital for the cell's functions. So mitochondria, the nucleus which contains DNA, the Golgi apparatus, the ribosomes, um, the endoplasmic reticulum, etc. So the soma is the cell body which contains the cytosol, organelles, and the cytoplasm. So the soma is roughly 20 microns in diameter, or 20 micrometers in diameter. The cytosol is the watery fluid that lies inside of the cell. And note that the cytosol is very rich in potassium, and this is going to make sense, um, particularly in next lecture when we talk about the resting membrane state, when we look at why is the neuron more negative inside versus outside the cell. So this is very important when we discuss the actual information processing of neurons. Organelles are membrane-enclosed structures that are found within the soma, such as the Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria, ER, the nucleus, etc. The cytoplasm is the contents within a cellular membrane. This includes the organelles excluding the nucleus. So signals that come in through the dendrites and from presynaptic cells are all integrated at the level of the soma. So you have information that will come in through the dendrites. That information will travel into the soma, at which point that information will be integrated. The nucleus is a large spherical structure contained within the nuclear envelope, and this is an organelle that is found within the soma. So here's the soma right here, and here we're emphasizing the nucleus. This nuclear envelope is a double membrane perforated by pores, allowing for um, information to go out in regards to mRNAs. So the nucleus contains the chromosomes, which in turn contain our DNA, or our genetic material. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, contains our hereditary information that will direct protein synthesis. So this is involved in gene expression. Gene expression is simply the expression of segments of DNA known as genes to allow for certain proteins to be created. So each chromosome contains large numbers of genes, which are simply parts of a DNA molecule. So here's a segment of DNA. A gene of interest, particularly, may be right here. So this segment of the DNA molecule is a particular gene. And through the process of transcription and translation, what we can do is we can actually interpret the information that is found in this segment of DNA. We can transcribe it, and then we can translate it, and we can turn it into a protein. So chromosomes contain our DNA. We have 23 pairs, so that's 46 chromosomes and each gene is part of the DNA molecule. So again, we have inside of our nucleus, we have our chromosomes, and a gene, which is a segment of the DNA. So reading of the DNA leads to the synthesis of proteins. So the protein synthesis is essentially reading that small segment of DNA known as a gene. Now the DNA in neurons is the same as that in the kidney or the heart. The DNA that is found in our body, in all of our cells, is the exact same. 
it doesn't differ. It's not brain DNA versus kidney DNA or heart DNA. The only thing that differs is the actual specific parts of the DNA that are used in assembling the cell. So these are particular genes. In your heart, in your brain, in your kidney, in your liver, etc., certain genes are going to be read and expressed, whereas other genes are not going to be. So proteins exist in many shapes and sizes, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail um, in the next few lectures, as well as this one, in talking about receptors, um, enzymes, transporters, etc. So these proteins exist in many shapes and sizes and perform numerous functions, in which give neurons their unique characteristics. And this is what allows for neurons to behave the way they do because of the way that these proteins are functioning. So all proteins are created during this process of gene expression. And again, gene expression is simply, here's your double-stranded helix. Gene expression is simply the reading of a segment of that DNA, and that segment of DNA is known as a gene. So the building blocks of all proteins are amino acids. There are 20 essential amino acids, or there are 20 amino acids that you have. You are not going to be required to memorize them. However, if you are going into medicine or biochemistry, understanding the amino acids in terms of their structures and functions and the way that they react chemically will be able to help when looking at a particular protein or in being able to hypothesize about certain mutations. So some neurotransmitters actually have amino acids as their precursors. So the catecholamines, um, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, are all catecholamines, and these um, are all products from tyrosine. Serotonin, GABA. GABA is actually a byproduct from glutamate. So amino acids contain an amino group and a carboxylic acid functional group. So hence, amino acids. They have an amino group and an acid group. Now the way that amino acids can be characterized are by the chemical reactivity of their side groups. So all amino acids carry the same basic structure. And then this fourth group is an R group. Now all this is saying is here's your acid, here's your amino group, here's a hydrogen, and then your 20 amino acids are going to have different R groups. So the simplest amino acid like glycine will have an H here. Whereas something like lysine or arginine will have a very long strand as an R group. So these R groups can be nonpolar or apolar, they can be polar uncharged, they can be positive or negatively charged, or they can be aromatic. Now again, this isn't a biochemistry course per se, so I'm not going to you know, require you to understand and know all of these different functional groups. However, something like tyrosine, an aromatic amino acid because of the presence of this benzene ring, as well as the fact that it has a hydroxyl group coming off this benzene ring, this is going to behave a little bit differently than something like glycine, where glycine only has a hydrogen as its R group and not this huge bulky side group. Now, when you talk about proteins as being just strings of amino acids, if you were to replace tyrosine with something smaller or tyrosine with something larger, that might throw a kink or a bend or it might impact the way that the protein is able to fold on itself. And if you impact protein folding, then you're going to impact protein functioning. And that's a really big idea, particularly in the field of biochemistry, as well as in neuroscience for proteins, is that if you mess up essentially the string of letters that are putting together the protein you are going to mess up or you can mess up rather the way that the protein is going to function. So protein synthesis occurs within the cytoplasm and this is one big thing to understand is that DNA never leaves the nucleus. So DNA is inside the nucleus so in order to actually get DNA which is found with inside the nucleus out and this is something you want to do, right? Because if you think about proteins, proteins are not just found in the nucleus. Proteins are found on the cell membranes, right? They're found out in the cytosol. They're enzymes, examples of transporters, receptors, etc. 
So the way that DNA is going to be able to essentially quote unquote leave is through messenger RNA. So there are four different nucleic acids, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. This is in RNA. DNA, you have thymine. So A to T, adenine to thymine, cytosine to guanine. This is in DNA. In RNA, you have A to U, or adenine to uracil, and then cytosine to guanine. So the sequence of nucleic acids that are represented from this DNA in regard in form of messenger RNA represents genetic information. So we'll go through the process of transcription and translation. So going back to this, we have Again, I'm really horrible, I'm really sorry at butchering DNA. But we have a segment of our DNA, which is known as a gene. Hopefully by the end of this lecture I'll have said it enough times that you understand that. The process of transcription and translation essentially takes this gene and says, okay, what is this gene supposed to be? We are able to transcribe it and translate what it means by looking at these nucleic acids. So step one in synthesizing a protein is to first assemble a piece of mRNA. That is going to contain the information of a gene, and this is known as transcription. So transcription is the process whereby we take DNA and we're able to get out a segment of mRNA. So transcription takes place specifically in the nucleus. The resulting mRNA that is obtained is known as a transcript, and that transcript is able to leave the nucleus through those nuclear pores. Remember the nuclear envelope that surrounds the nucleus. We're able to take that mRNA transcript that is a transcript from what the DNA is saying and we're able to take that out of the nucleus. Because remember, DNA doesn't leave. However, we can take the transcript or that messenger RNA that is made from the DNA and remove it. So this will start at the promoter region by binding of RNA polymerase, which is regulated by several transcription factors. And it goes until a terminator sequence or a stop sequence, which is the endpoint of transcription. Because you're not just going to transcribe the entire segment of DNA, right? You're going to transcribe only particular segments or the particular genes of interest. Remember that the DNA is the same in all of your bodily organs everywhere, right? It's just the parts of the DNA that are red those are what are different in the brain versus the heart versus the lungs versus the stomach versus the liver versus the kidney, right? Your brain is going to require certain proteins and certain transporters and enzymes compared to the stomach or the liver. So there are non-coding regions of DNA that flank genes, and there are often additional stretches of DNA that aren't used to code proteins. I didn't come up with the nomenclature, so don't blame me for this. But the used regions are known as exons, and the unused regions are known as introns. I know it's sort of counterintuitive, and it sort of seems backwards, but that's the nomenclature. So in the process of transcription, you start at a promoter region, and you'll go into a terminator region, that is your gene. You have exons, which will actually be used, and then you have the introns that are not. So initial transcripts contain both exons and introns, and through the process of RNA splicing, those introns are removed and the remaining exons are fused together. So transcription of a single gene can give rise to several different mRNAs and protein products, depending on how the RNA splicing goes. So let me click this link. So this is a really good link um, that goes through the process of transcription, and I'll bring it up here. If I can enable Adobe. Here we go. Okay. Let me see if I can. There we go. Okay. So here are the bases of DNA A, T, G, and C adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. We have a promoter region. 
that is going to be the start of our gene expression, right? So DNA is the template for the synthesis of RNA. And we're going to create a messenger RNA transcript. So the DNA helix unwinds, and transcription will start at the promoter region, a particular location where RNA polymerase will initiate the synthesis of our mRNA transcript. So if we go right down here, we can click. So notice what's happening here is we're getting an mRNA transcript. And you can see this right here. And this is why I like this website, just because it's able to go through the whole process. And you can go either fast or more slow compared to how I'm going. Feel free to move at your own pace. But here is this tiny little transcript. So transcription continues until an entire gene has been converted to RNA. So note that this is your transcript. And the entire segment of DNA was not transcribed. So the new RNA strand separates from DNA, and this is now your mRNA transcript, which can then leave the nucleus. So here we go. So RNA can be modified before going out of the cell nucleus. So um, these often um, include certain changes like um, adenosine ribonucleotides that are added post-transcription, and that aids in stability of the transcript or methylguanosine caps. And then removal of introns that don't really play um, huge roles in protein synthesis. So this is the process of transcription. Okay, so let's go back to here. So mRNA transcripts exit via the pores in the nuclear envelope, and they will travel to the sites of protein synthesis known as ribosomes. Now ribosomes can be free ribosomes, meaning that they're not attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, or if they're attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, it's known as rough ER. So the process of transcription was taking our segment of DNA, transcribing it into a messenger RNA. Now the process of translation is linking together the amino acids that are coded in codons. Codons are sequences of three RNA nucleotides that correspond to a particular amino acid. So if you remember the four different bases, C, A, G, and U, if you break them into threes, they are going to code in themselves a particular amino acid. Remember that proteins are built from chains of amino acids. So as you read this RNA transcript in the process of translation, you're able to say, okay, if there's a CAG, that means glutamine. That's the first amino acid. The second amino acid might be GAC. That's an aspartate. So you now know the second amino acid is aspartate. And you're reading down the, down the transcript. So if you think about it, what happens if you're translating something? If you're translating something, you're taking what is in front of you and you're producing meaning, right? You're taking it and saying, okay, that is a word that means this. That means this. The same thing in protein synthesis. You're translating a line of essentially code into something meaningful in, in this regard to protein. So here is the website going to RNA um, protein synthesis. So this is the process of translation. So here's the mRNA that has um, left the nucleus and is now within the cytoplasm. You have tRNA, um, which is going to be able to carry certain amino acids. Okay. Now notice right here, we're reading these codons, right? So this is on the site of the messenger RNA transcript. And we're able to say, okay, A, U, and G. A, U, and G codes for methionine. Methionine is going to be now added to our protein. The next code is AAA. AAA codes for lysine. So note, here are the little proteins, and these are these little amino, sorry, these are the amino acids. And as we go on, they're going to connect. And this continues along the entire strand of your transcript. Every three bases are going to be read and are going to code for a different amino acid. 
So note how there is now a strand growing. This is a peptide. Now, at the very end of your transcript, there are often the stop codons. This means there is a stop point. So here is your peptide. So DNA, in the process of transcription, gave you an mRNA transcript. RNA, through the process of translation, will give you a peptide. A peptide is a small protein. Okay. So protein synthesis occurs at globular structures in cytoplasm known as ribosomes. So ribosomes use the blueprint from mRNA to create proteins from amino acids. So you have the rough ER, and free ribosomes, which are freely floating. Rough ER, you have the ribosomes which are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Initial bodies, and these are types of stains that you can actually look at um, cell bodies because of the fact that the stains are being bound um, to the nucleus and to areas around the nuclei. So several free polyribosomes or ribosomes may appear to be attached by a thread, and this includes a single strand of mRNA. So there are different types of proteins. You have cytosolic proteins, which can exist within the cytosol. A good example of, this, um, of these are enzymes. And then membrane-bound proteins. A membrane-bound protein is exactly what it sounds like. You have the membrane, and you have a protein, which is found embedded within the membrane. A good example of a membrane-bound protein is a transporter or a receptor, which is going to allow for ions to be able to flow through the outside to the inside of the cell, or vice versa. Cytosolic proteins, such as an enzyme, might be acting on certain things that exist within the cytosol, let's say. Cytosolic proteins are synthesized on free ribosomes. Membrane-bound proteins are synthesized on the rough ER. So this is an important thing to understand based on the numerous membrane proteins that exist in neurons. So protein synthesis on free ribosomes will result in a protein that is not bound to the membrane, and a membrane-associated protein will be synthesized on the rough ER. So DNA to mRNA is the process of transcription, and mRNA to protein is the process of translation. This animation demonstrates how the digital information encoded within DNA is used to direct protein synthesis. This is a DNA double helix containing the digital code which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. And here we see a protein complex called an RNA polymerase traveling down the DNA strand. As it moves down the strand, it carefully unwinds the DNA, preparing it for transcription. Inside the polymerase, we see a single stranded copy of the original instructions being assembled as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. A stop code marks the end of the protein specification, at which point this copy, known as a messenger RNA transcript, exits the polymerase and heads towards a two-part chemical manufacturing machine called the ribosome. And remember that the ribosomes, I'm sorry if I scared you by the way, you probably weren't expecting to hear me, um, if it is a free ribosome, you're going to get a cytosolic protein. If it's a mem if it's membrane bound, protein, you're going to be synthesized by a ribosome on the rough ER. While the messenger RNA moves towards the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules attach to specific amino acids in preparation for assembly. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. Using the instructions encoded on the messenger RNA as a template, the transfer RNA molecules align specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids, creating a protein chain. As this chain exits the ribosome, it is met by chaperones which prevent premature folding while escorting the protein to a barrel-shaped machine called a chaperonin. This machine helps fold the protein into the precise shape required to perform its function. Although it is unclear how the chaperonin achieves this, 
we do know that accurate folding is essential in order for the protein to accomplish its intended function. Once the protein is complete, it is released into the cytoplasm to do its job. So the process of transcription, you take your DNA and you're able to create a transcript, which can then leave the nucleus and be translated into a protein. So neuronal genes, genetic variation, genetic engineering, being able to look at, again, more um, in depth in terms of just regular neuronal functioning. So neurons differ from other cells because of, again, specific genes that are going to be encoded. So through the Human Genome Project, we know that there's about 25,000 genes in human DNA. And by looking at these genes, We've been able to look at the genetic bases of many diseases of the nervous system, some that have purely genetic bases, like Huntington's disease, or others that may have a combination of several genes that could be something like risk factors. So genetic engineering and gene targeting through certain um, laboratory techniques such as DNA microarrays, which you can find in box 2.2 in your book, um, you can look at the analysis of expression of um, numerous genes simultaneously, where you can look at mRNA from particular brains of either individuals or animals, apply this to a DNA microarray, microarray setup, and be able to look at um, whether certain genes are reduced or um, equivalent in terms of expression compared to other sections or other segments. So genetic engineering is a way to change organisms by design, either through mutations of genes or through insertions of genes. Now, mice are often subjects because they have very similar nervous systems to ours and they reproduce very quickly. Um, the gestation period of a mouse and the reproductive cycle of a mouse is about three weeks from the point where the mom is able to be pregnant to the point where the mom gives birth. That's about three weeks of time. So we have different types of mice that could be used in studies when we're looking particularly at gene mutations. We have knockout mice where a gene has been deleted. We can use these mice to be able to study disease progression with hopes to correct um, it. So we wanted to look at the importance of a particular receptor or the importance of a particular enzyme. One thing that we could do is actually genetically engineer a mouse to not express that gene, to not express that protein. Then we can see how that behavior or the way brain function changes as a result of lack of that receptor. Transgenic mice are mice whose genes have been introduced and are now overexpressed, and these are known as transgenes. And these are examples of knock-in mice where native genes are replaced with modified transgenes. So transgenic mice are often the subject of, or are really the subject of, a lot of disease progression studies. For example, I myself do work with Alzheimer's disease, and mice don't develop Alzheimer's in the same way that, or in the way that people develop Alzheimer's. In Alzheimer's disease, you have plaques and tangles which accumulate within the brain, but even when mice get old, they don't develop these plaques and tangles like we do. So one thing that I have to do in my research is introduce human amyloid protein and human tau protein, or mutations in those, in, in those genes to be able to result in a mouse developing plaques and tangles to be able to study the same um, human disease. So still within the soma, so we have the smooth ER and the Golgi apparatus. These are sites for preparing and sorting proteins. Again, we talked about um, the ER as being important for that, particularly the ribosomes. For sorting proteins for delivery to different cell regions and for regulating substances. The smooth ER has a role in regulation of internal calcium stores. It is also a site of protein folding. And the Golgi apparatus plays a role in post-translational processing of um, proteins. The soma also contains mitochondria, which are the sites of cellular respiration. Through the process of the Krebs cycle, we're able to obtain ATP, which is cellular energy, and it's the cell's energy source. So this helps to fuel biochemical reactions in the cell. And ATP is going to be very important, particularly when we talk about pumps um, in the nervous system, like the sodium-potassium pump. 
The, the neuronal membrane is the barrier that encloses the cytoplasm. So if we go back to this right here, our neuronal membrane is what is able to keep everything inside the neuron. We don't just have a continual exchange of information from the outside going to the inside, right? There's an actual barrier there. So this is studied with proteins, such as transporters, receptors, and pores. It's about 5 nanometers thick. And the protein concentration in the membrane varies, and this depends on where you're at in the, in the neuron. So are you in the dendrite, are you in the axon, or are you in the soma? So the structure of discrete membrane regions helps to influence neural functioning. So the transferring of electrical signals, um, where you're at in the membrane, whether you are in a dendrite where you have a lot of receptors, or in the axon where you don't really have a lot of receptors. This is going to influence the connections that can be made and the functions of those regions. So moving down into um, the axon hillock and the axon, we have the cytoskeleton, which are the internal scaffolding of the neuronal membrane. This helps to give the neuron its characteristic shape. Now, the cytoskeleton is not static. It is always able to be um, fluid in terms of plasticity, dynamically regulated and in continual motion. So there are three main structures that we need to um, take into account, the microtubules, microfilaments, and neurofilaments. And they're, um, very, they vary based on size. So microtubules are relatively large. They'll run longitudinally down neurites. So the monomer form is known as tubulin, and its polymer form is microtubule. So several tubulins come together, several tubulin subunits come together to form a microtubule. Polymerization is just joining small proteins together to form a longer strand. So tubulin is the primary component of the axon shaft. So this is what allows for axon elongation. And these microtubule-associated proteins are able to anchor microtubules to one another, allowing for the axon to remain in its um, extended state. Now, axonal microtubule-associated proteins um, can actually be seen to fall apart in Alzheimer's disease due to changes in tau, which is a microtubule-associated protein. Tau is able to be hyperphosphorylated in the case of Alzheimer's disease and be phosphorylated. If you have too much phosphorylation going on on the tau proteins that are helping to stabilize these microtubule networks, then you have a disintegration of those networks, allowing for um, axonal communication to be disrupted. If you have information traveling down the microtubules, and then you are essentially ruining those microtubules, then you're going to have an impediment of information flow. So neurofibrillary tangles. You have tangle formation in the cerebral cortex due to um, hyperphosphorylation in the brain and increases in inflammation and amyloid beta presence in Alzheimer's disease. So major components of tangles that are found within the brain of AD patients are known as perihelical filaments, which consist of tau proteins. So in Alzheimer's disease, tau accumulates within the soma. It doesn't act as a bridge to ensure microtubules run correctly, and your axons wither, essentially impeding information flow. So neuronal neurofilaments fluoresce green in this stain right here, um, which are a symbol of viable neurons. So the arrow right here contains a neurofilament, and this is a healthy neuron. Now, the presence of tau within neurofibrillary tangles fluoresces red here in this particular stain. Now the big arrow is starting to show accumulation in this cell. Small arrow, no neurofilaments, this is essentially a dead neuron. So note here that you don't really see this neuron present around here. So now if we superimpose these images, you have this major green cell which contains neurofilaments, which is a component of the cytoskeleton, with a tiny starting to have a, a hue of yellow due to the superimposition. But here you have these neurons that are highly um, contagious, in term, not contagious as terms of one to another, but they contain um, neurofibrillary tangles, which are essentially choking the neuron from proper functioning. Microfilaments are found throughout the neuron. They're very numerous in neurites, so these neuritic extensions. So braids of two thin strands that are polymers of the protein actin. This is one of the most abundant proteins in cells of all different types. And you have actin and filament dynamics, which help to orient our growth cones towards or away from local substrates. 
Now this is um, really important in particular for development of the nervous system, so setting the direction of growth cone movements and for the construction of neural circuits. So when these cells are needing to find and locate different regions to make connections to, these actin filament dynamics are going to help in creating a way for the cell oops, sorry, to be able to find what it's attracted to or be repelled against. So this is the primary component of the lamellipodia and the philopodia that are found out here. The lamellipodia, um, if you look at your hand, the lamellipodia is an example of like your palm, whereas the philopodia, if you wiggle, wiggle your fingers, those are examples of philopodia. Actin and film, um, actin filaments are going to be important for being able to make sure that that is going to be able to change in shape and movement, right? In terms of direction. Neurofilaments are intermediate in size between the very large microtubules and the very small microfilaments. These are intermediate in all different cell types and they're known as neurofilaments in neurons. So they're mechanically very strong. Multiple subunits sub wind together into a rope-like structure and each strand consists of individual long protein molecules. So here's an example of a um, growth cone, our lamellipodia and our philopodia, sensing the chemical environment. Our axon, which is this very long extended um, neurite, and then you have your neurofilament that lies here, your microtubules that are going along the axon, and then microfilaments, which have a very high population in and around our growth cone in our lamellipodia and our philopodia. So the axon is only found in neurons and it helps to send information over very long distances. So here's the dendrites right here, apical and basilar dendrites. Now remember that these dendrites are all bringing information in. That information will be integrated in the soma and then information will leave via the axon. The axon hillock is the beginning region of the axon. It tapers away from the soma, and this is also known as the axon initial segment. So differences arise between the axon and the soma. The endoplasmic reticulum does not extend into the axon, meaning that there is no direct protein synthesis going on here in the axon. There is no protein synthesis going on. The, um, there is a unique protein composition, though, um, in the um, axon, and as we'll see when we talk about the neuronal membrane at rest as well as in activity in the action potential, you'll see that there are proteins that are embedded within the axon, particularly at nodes of Ranvier, where you have information that needs to travel down those microtubule networks to be able to deliver those proteins. Now as we get to the end of an axon, you have the terminal bouton or the axon terminal. So here is an example of a terminal button or bouton. So here is the axon, here's our soma, and then we have little dendrites right here. This is our axon, and this is the axon terminal because it is the end of the axon. The synapse is a contact with other neurons that allows for the passing of information. So I drew this a little before, but you're going to have a synaptic terminal or an axon terminal from one neuron making a connection to a dendrite most of the time um, in a separate neuron. So synaptic connections are made and the cell is said to be innervated. The receiving cell is said to be innervated by the information that is sent from the presynaptic cell. So this is the presynaptic cell because it is occurring before the synapse and the receiving cell is known as the postsynaptic cell because it is lying after the synapse. So slight differences between the cytoplasm of the axon terminal and the axon. There are no microtubules found within the terminal itself. In the terminal, you have the presence of synaptic vesicles, which contain neurotransmitters, and we'll talk a lot about, a lot about those in chapters 5 and 6. You have an abundance of membrane proteins that are found in the terminal as well as in dendrites, because these are examples of receptors, which are going to be able, or transporters, being able to bring information back into the presynaptic cell, and receptors on the postsynaptic cell able to take information and um, transform that information into a um, electrical signal. So there are large numbers of mitochondria as well, due to the high energy demand that is necessary um, at the level of the terminal. The synapse allows for engagement in synaptic transmission. 
So here's a brief image of our mitochondria that are found within the presynaptic axon terminal. We have synaptic vesicles that contain our neurotransmitters, and then these neurotransmitters will be able to be released onto a postsynaptic cell. So neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters are the chemical signals that help to cross the synapse and will bind to receptors that are studded on the postsynaptic membrane. This is where drugs come in. All drugs have their effects at the level of the synapse. So in this whole process, this is an electrical to chemical to electrical transformation. So you have information coming down in an electrical sense. Chemicals will be released. This will interact with proteins that are found on the postsynaptic membrane, and this will allow for an electrical um, communication to occur. So synaptic transmission dysfunction leads to mental disorders, as well as to several brain disorders. So transport along the um, axon is due to particular proteins. So note that proteins must be synthesized in the soma because that is where the whole process of transcription and translation occurs. And in order for proteins to be able to come down, they need to be transported. So anterograde is from the soma to the terminal, whereas retrograde transmission is from the terminal to the soma. So if I were to draw a neuron right here, very crude drawing of a neuron with some dendrites, and then here's the axon going down, and then here's the terminal, anterograde is going from the soma down to the terminal, retrograde is going from the terminal up towards the soma. So material becomes enclosed in vesicles and is literally walked down the microtubule networks um, through kinesin, which is a protein, which is fueled by ATP. Now, you literally will have protein that is found within these vesicles and will be transported down to where it's needed. So this ties back into, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, when you have a disruption in its microtubule network right here, where this protein, kinesin, is unable to actually walk down the protein, um, walk down the protein to where it needs to go. So one way that we can measure this is actually to inject the soma with radioactive amino acids, which are components of proteins, and then track the arrival of those proteins in the axon terminal. So let's say we want to be able to track a transporter where we know the transporter will be found at the terminal. If we inject radioactive amino acids here, those radioactive amino acids will be incorporated into the protein and will be walked down. Retrograde transport is um, done through a process of the protein dynein, which is able to bring protein from here in the terminal up back towards the cell body. So a little bit more on retrograde transport, where um, enzymes are able to be brought back from the terminals up to the soma. You can use certain chemical reactions um, to visualize locations of this horseradish peroxidase um, one good example is um, particularly through immunohistochemistry. Herpes virus, the oral type, will enter the axon terminals in the lips and mouth and will then be transported to parent cell bodies and it actually remains dormant until physical or emotional stress and can then replicate and then return back, return back to those nerve endings, um, resulting in a painful sore. Rabies is also another um, example of something that is able to be transported in a retrograde fashion. This will enter the axon terminals in the skin and can be taken up by numerous cells and can brought into the central nervous system. And this can ultimately continue until death if not treated um, very quickly. So dendrites serve as the antenna of neurons, which are being able to bring in information. The dendritic tree is a reference known to the fact that um, these branches of dendrites come in all several, um, numerous different shapes and sizes and the different sizes can be used to classify different neuronal groups. So dendrites contain cytoskeletal elements as well as a mitochondria. Polyribosomes do exist, often right underneath spines that lie within the dendrites that can help direct local protein synthesis in some neurons. And then synapse, at the level of the synapse, you have receptors. So dendritic spines um, are postsynaptic, so these help to receive signals from axon terminals of a presynaptic cell, and these are important targets for synaptic input. So there has been research, particularly in regards to intellectual disabilities, 
in regards to how changes in dendritic structure and dendritic spines can actually lead to um, intellectual disability. So fewer dendritic spines have been noted in low-functioning children, and the spines that these low-functioning children did have were very long and thin compared to the dendrite from a normal infant, which had these synaptic spines um, in close um, junction with each other. So the extent of spine changes tended to correlate with degree of intellectual disability. And note correlation. Um, correlation doesn't equal causation, so we can't assume that just because there is a um, certain amount of spine changes that an individual would have an intellectual disability. But maturation does depend critically on the environment during infancy and early childhood, and we've seen this through a lot of animal studies as well as in um, human tissue. Um, as you have more environmental enrichment, you'll have an increase in um, the surface area of these dendrites through the presence of these spines, which can act as additional sensory input or additional input to a neuron. So classification of neurons began with the development of the Golgi stain. And a few ways that we can classify neurons is based on number of neurites. So here's an example of a unipolar cell. And this is a unipolar because it has one extension coming from the soma. So a single neurite is known as a unipolar cell. A bipolar cell is where you have two extensions coming from the soma. You have a dendritic extension and an axonal extension. Multi is greater than two. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is an example of a multipolar cell. Now, all neurons are not this pretty in terms of being able to be classified. Um, if you're thinking about like a multipolar cell, you're never really only going to have like eight or seven. You'll have hundreds of extensions. Um, this unipolar or pseudo unipolar cell is a good example of. Um, like in the sensory systems as well as in bipolar cells are great examples of sensory system um, neuronal networks and then multipolar cells are often found um, like in the cerebral cortex. So again a single neurite this is a neurite that is coming off of the soma there's only one so it is a unipolar cell here you have two connections coming from the soma thus it's a bipolar cell and anything greater than two is known as a multipolar cell. So classifying neurons can often, um, also be done based on dendritic and somatic morphology. So these are often unique to a particular part of the brain or a region of the brain. Such as the cerebral cortex, you have a large amount of stellate cells or star-shaped cells, as well as pyramidal cells. These are based on how they look. So all pyramidal sp cells are spiny cells, meaning that they contain spines. And stellate cells can either be spiny or aspinous, meaning presence of spines or absence of spines. In the cerebellum, cerebellar cortex, you have different cells including stellate cells, Purkinje cells, Golgi cells, basket cells, granule cells, and these cells are going to be not only classified based on their structure and function, but also based on their neurotransmitter that they're able to um, be conveying, so in an excitatory or inhibitory fashion. And then neurons can be either classified as spiny, which are always excitatory, or aspinous, meaning lack of spines. Further classifications can be done based on whether they are leaving the central nervous system or bringing information into the central nervous system. The central nervous system is known as made up of the brain and spinal cord. So primary sensory neurons from our sensory systems will be bringing information out from the periphery into the central nervous system. So brain, spinal cord. Motor neurons help to synapse with muscles and command movement so we have information coming from here and actually going out towards muscles. That's a motor neuron. Thinking about just movement in general, you need to be able to produce movement. A motor neuron will allow for that to occur. And then interneurons are um, smaller neurons which help to form connections with other neurons that are found within a given structure. So a great example of this would be like in the spinal cord. So let's draw the spinal cord right here. So information, um, let's say, from here to here. This would be a good example of a reflex arc where sensory information is coming in here, 
This is an interneuron because it is able to convey information within a given structure and forming a connection. So you can also classify based on axonal length. So you can say that a neuron is a projection neuron or a Golgi type 1 neuron if it is projecting from one brain region or structure to another or a Golgi type 2 neuron where this is an example of a local circuit neuron. So an interneuron would be a Golgi type 2 neuron or a local circuit neuron. Whereas projection neurons would be something like um, sensory or motor neurons, etc. You can classify neurons based on gene expression. So looking at the creation of transgenic mice and whether neurons contain green fluorescent protein or other proteins that have been introduced. You can also classify neurons based on the type of neurotransmitter that they contain. So you can say some neurons are excitatory or inhibitory. Or you can also say that if they contain acetylcholine, you can call them acetylcholinergic neurons. Or if they contain dopamine, they're dopaminergic neurons. So certain neurons contain proteins or enzymes which are important for the synthesis of particular neurotransmitters, and we'll talk a lot about this in chapters 5 and 6. Um, the neuromuscular junction, uh, motor neurons releasing acetylcholine, these express genes that are enabling the use of acetylcholine. So these neurons are known as cholinergic or acetylcholinergic neurons. And the last little bit is talking about glia. So the function of glia is to support neuronal functioning. And glia does a lot more than just that. There are several different types of glia. Um, astrocytes, this is one of the most numerous glia that are found in the brain. These help to fill the spaces between the neurons, and they help do a large number of roles, including influencing neurite growth and helping to regulate the chemical content of the extracellular space through the process of potassium spatial buffering. They help to remove neurotransmitters. They help to contain the spread of neurotransmitters. And some even contain receptors for neurotransmitters. So in this electron microscope um, diagram, you can see the synapse right here. This is a presynaptic axon terminal making a connection to a postsynaptic dendritic spine. And this blue is this astrocyte process that is taking into account this extracellular space, being able to, again, restrict the spread of any neurotransmitter that's released here, or be able to actually take up anything like excess um, potassium ions that are found in this extracellular fluid. Two other important um, categories of glia are the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells, which are known as myelinating glia. And note that myelinating glia have different names based on where they're at. So if you're in the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, these are oligodendrocytes or oligodendroglia, where one oligodendrocyte contributes myelin to several axons, whereas in the peripheral nervous system, these myelinating glia are known as Schwann cells, where only one myelinates a single axon. So an example of this would be, here's one axon, here's myelin, this is one Schwann cell, myelin, one Schwann cell, myelin, another Schwann cell. This is in the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, let's say we have three axons, you could have an oligodendrocyte providing myelin to cell 1, to cell 2, as well as to cell 3. So this is in the central nervous system, Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. So myelin sheath is an insulation for axons, which helps to serve to speed the nerve impulse propagation down the axon. And in the case of multiple sclerosis, you have a um, disintegration of myelin sheath. So oligodendrocytes are found, again, within the central nervous system. And the nodes of Ronvia are these regions where the axonal membrane is exposed, meaning that you don't have a myelin surrounding this node of Ronvia. Now, this is important because what's present here are voltage-gated sodium channels. And these will be um, a lot more important when we start talking about, in chapters 3 and 4, the presence of where these proteins are in these channels and why, in the node of Ronvia, is this unmyelinated or exposed. So other non-neuronal cells that are important include ependymal cells, which line fluid-filled ventricles within the brain, helping to direct cell migration during brain development, as well as creating tight junctions, as is um, seen in the blood-brain barrier. 
You have microglia, which act as phagocytes, playing roles for immune functioning. They help to remove debris left by dead or dying neurons and glia. They can migrate into the brain from the blood. And disruption of microglia can interfere with brain functions and behavior. In Alzheimer's disease, we see an upregulation in inflammatory cytokines and um, an upregulation of microglia activity. And then the vasculature helps to deliver blood to neurons, and these are essential nutrients and oxygen. So structural characteristics of the neuron help to provide insight into not only how neurons work, um, but how do the different parts come together to create a cohesive act action, right? So one of the biggest things to understand in neuroscience is that structure correlates with function. So if you look at particular areas of the neuron, so let's say the axon terminal has a very high amount of mitochondria. Well, this can be um, due to the fact that there's a high energy demand in releasing all of these neurotransmitters. The axon has an absence of ribosomes. Well, the function of that is so that the axoplasmic transport of proteins occurs. You don't have direct protein synthesis going on in the axon. Do you have an elaborate dendritic tree? If you have more and more dendrites, that creates more and more surface area, so you are able to receive more and more incoming information. Okay, and with that, that's the end of chapter two. And in the next chapter, we'll start talking about the neuronal membrane at rest.